Um, hold on one second, actually. All right, yeah, that'll work. Um, thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming again, and apologies for the confusion on the time. Um, for anyone, uh, I, I am actually going to do a separate, separate, second one of these in the beginning of January, um, and then hopefully at that point have even uh, more uh, specific timelines. Uh, and I'll explain why the timelines take some time to 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 get on in a second. So welcome. Um, thank you for being interested or for any interest in the um, open source research experience um, uh, program that we uh, have here at that we manage here at UC Santa Cruz under our um, open source program office and the Center for Research and Open Source Software. I'm Stephanie Ligi. I'm the executive director uh, of um, of the Center for Research and Open Source Software, as well as the um, Open Source Program Office that we are creating here at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, Carlos on the call is um, uh, the director of both the, the of, of Cross as well as the OSPO as well. And um, and we have on the call a number of folks who are uh, two of our previous um, mentors. Uh, yeah, we've got two two previous mentors. Um, and so I, I, any questions you might have for other mentors, and I think a few more will, will be joining us uh, in the course of the discussion. Uh, so um, if you have, th those of you who are new to this program have questions that maybe specific, you can th throw in the chat or just ask at any point, just raise your hand and ask. Um, uh, yeah, Carlos, you wanna? Yeah, thanks, Stephanie. I just want to also quickly welcome everyone. Um, and I'm also, I want to announce that I'm retiring. Um, so my last day is actually December 15th, but um, uh, Stephanie will uh, continue this and uh, will actually, you know, uh, also have a more of a leadership role in this. And then also work with, together with James Davis, who is a, a faculty at UC Santa Cruz, uh, who is going to lead uh, the Center for Research and Open Source Software, which is the divisional part of our open source efforts. Um, so uh, so this is, uh, I'm really happy that this will continue to be in very good hands and um, and we'll be, you know, watching this uh, for the years to come. So thank you so much for, for having interest and being interested in this program. Thanks, Carlos. Um, all right, great. Uh, Ho Jun, just in... Uh, joining us. Welcome. And uh, again, uh, one of our previous mentors. So uh, thanks for coming. Uh, let's see if I here. So everyone can see my slides, I'm hoping. I just wanted to first give a quick overview of what we are doing and why we're doing this particular program. A lot and a lot of our focus is on uh, amplifying research impact uh, via open source. That's a huge uh, activity that a huge part of our goal and our aims with regards to um, all the programs we do as part of the OSPO uh, here at Santa Cruz, the open source program office here at Santa Cruz. Um, but more, uh, and then more recently over uh, um, in the last year, we have been lucky to have be working with uh, NYU and University of Chicago on the Repetto pro, uh, project, which is an NSF funded project that's focusing on simplifying reproducibility in computational research. And that is, um, I think, probably what's interesting to a number of you folks coming in that were particularly interested in the summer of reproducibility. That is actually the source of our support for that particular program. And we're really excited. It was a very successful program last year that we were able to integrate into our open, our general open source research experience uh, program, which I will talk about in more detail now. Um, but the, and one of the main reasons for the activities that we're doing under this program, the Open Source Research Experience Program, um, is really to connect these stakeholders. We see that, um, and I'll give a history of how this kind of all came about in a second, but this is really the, fo the focus of the activity is to connect you who are mentors and researchers and scientists with really, really interested students um, and help have them help you, uh, and uh, and then have sponsors who are also very engaged and interested in supporting your work. And this nice virtuous circle um, that uh, and this is originally from when we were mainly looking at open source research projects. But this also can this also holds true for our efforts with regards to um, uh, reproducibility artifacts and um, practical reproducibility. Mm -hmm. uh, so a quick background 
um, what, how we started, how OSRE started, um, it's part as we uh, actually the uh, the Cro cross the Center for Research and Open Source Software um, got involved with the Google Summer of Code, uh, so and that which is a really uh, well known program in open source. Uh, it's been around uh, now going on. It'll be its thirtieth year next year, um, and it sees students from all around the world and mentors and students connected um, remotely. It's this has been going on for thirty years. Basically, it's always been remote. Um, and it's, it's kind of, uh, I think, groundbreaking the extent to which they were doing this way before everybody else was doing it and connecting students and mentors um, in that way for such a long time. And we started being we started being involved with them in 2018. Um, and what it did for us was it started funding students um, who were new to open source and new to our projects and helping us build communities um, around those 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 projects. Um, again, it's uh, they these projects are fully remote. And what's nice now is there actually some flexibility on duration uh, and size. So we like this. We really had a great uh, experience with them. We we like this structure. These are the key actors that are involved with GSOC. Um, and you'll hear these terms used a lot in the op open source research experience discussions as well. Um, basically mentor organizations and org admin. So that is would be org admin would be myself um, and UCSC would be the mentor organization. And uh, then the mentors are you folks, you the, the academic researchers, project maintainers, and, and you are where the ideas are come from uh, for the students to work on. So they look to, to your research or your open source project, depending on uh, which part of the OSRE you're interested in, to, um, to create the work that they will do for you over the summer. And then we have contributors and students. And typically, historically, they've been undergraduates within GSOC, um, but basically uh, over the last few years that's adjusted and it's been anyone that's new to open source. And again, so this is this is the GSOC model that we, we kind of adapted into our open source research experience. And then re really the goal of this is to uh, jumpstart for, for the, op the open source aspect of it was to jumpstart contributor communities. Um, when we're talking about it from the, the um, reproducibility side and a summer reproducibility aspect that's also kind of increasing uh, the community with that and, and the students capabilities with regards to uh, creating reproducible artifacts and working in reproducibility. Um, we, it's really a great way to uh, bring students and scientists together. Uh, and also what we like about it and what helps, I think, your work as mentors and your um, experience as mentors is that we're able to really leverage. I'm oh, sorry, and I though I just realized that I didn't update that. What, what that link at the bottom that should be OSRE two four and not two three. Um, but uh, so the 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 we're, so we actually are able to leverage things like the the fact that we are typically to participate in and Google Summer of Code to reach out to a really global community when we're looking for students. So that's a, a huge positive. Um, you get to work with, like mentors get to work with really great students from all over the world. Um, and that I think answers one of the questions somebody had about, yes, you can have international students. Um, so this is what this is what last year looked like. It was our biggest year. Um, we had 38 contributors participating from, I, God, I don't remember how many countries, but it was a large, it was a good, like I feel like uh, eight different countries involved. Um, uh, we built, we, so we built the GSOC on, we, sorry, we built a OSRE on this GSOC model. Um, and we really do see that this huge benefit to mentors and students. Um, and then part of the reason we've had OSRE on top of GSOC is that we were trying to figure out a, a best way of expanding and scaling what we were doing, that it didn't have to be just one particular sponsor. It doesn't have to be just GSOC. We can actually create we can use GSAC as one sponsor, but we are also able to bring in other sponsors, um, other uh, other um, you know other people interested in supporting this uh, to to expand the type, not just the uh, the number of projects, but also the types of projects. Because GSAC had a kind of has a little bit of a limitation on what they want to sponsor, and we didn't necessarily see that as necessary for our long term goals. So. Um, 
uh, and in, in particular students, uh, students that maybe want to work with a faculty member. This is actually a big one is for me was that faculty members or researchers from a, a specific campus can't work with their own students under GSOC. So if, if ever that came up, I had to figure out another funding, like how to, to work with that, that the, the, them to work together. So that was part of one, you know, one thing that we noticed has been really helpful for having um, different sponsors and having the OSRE as, as a kind of overarching activity that we do with, with different uh, sponsors groups. But like I said, so last year we had this great um, uptick in the numbers. Um, oh, I don't think I, I thought I had a, it, it, yeah, my little like graph. So we started with like two, um, we started with two, uh, two in our, in 2018 and we moved up to uh, 38. And I think I do have a, a, a diagram of how that, that progress in a later slide. But one of the things I want to highlight is the, the new components that we brought in last year and uh, the summer reproducibility is a particularly, I think, important one for all the folks, a number of the folks on this call. Um, we, so we had one is a catalyst program, which is really focused on um, improving uh, the outreach to groups, uh, to um, minoritized groups and bringing them into open source. Um, um, and that that was a particular focus to uh, in HBCUs, and we're going to do that again next year. And this is an interesting one where the the students actually, a small group of the students actually come um, are resident for four weeks at UCSC and then work on open source project. So it's a little, it's again, it's a it's a, it's under the OSD umbrella, but it's a, it's different from kind of the projects that uh, most of the mentors typically work on. But the summer reproducibility, which is I think um, a number of you are particularly interested in. Um, again, that was an NSF funded grant, uh, NSF funded activity under our Repetto grant. And um, it specifically uh, aims to bring mentors from anywhere uh, working on reproducibility, um, reproducibility artifacts to work with students from around the world um, and creating an exchange for reproducibility artifacts. Um, that And that was, again, started last year. And um, and this is just a little bit of an overview on it. Um, I think we have some update. I will be updating some of this. Again, this is, uh, I think I have to update the page for the 2024, but it's very similar to last year on, on this, at least at this level. Um, uh, and this is, I mean, the, a lot of what we're focusing on is creating opportunities for contributors to acquire skills. So that's a large focus of the summer reproducibility is kind of helping you as those who are interested in reproducibility um, like uh, uh, move your work forward, but also um, empower more students and more new people to the uh, to the field uh, to build these skills. Um, and it also allows us to really work with broader uh, broader mentors. Where previously we were working very much with is open source projects focused and UC University of California only. Uh, mentors, this uh, and under summer reproducibility, we're we are enabled to work even with basically any any researcher or faculty working on on the issue. Right. Um, so again, this is how the evolution we went from two to thirty eight. So the big dif oops, ah, didn't mean to do that. Um, so the big difference was our. Uh, uh, so 2020 is when we started 2018, 2019, that was just GSOC and it was kind of, we were new. So we were, you know, having, we just had a few mentors. We were kind of small. Um, 2020, we actually started the OSRE specifically. So we wanted to get, we saw the need for more um, open source, uh, a more sponsor, more, uh, we were getting more mentors, but, you know, GSOC wasn't necessarily um, going to only be the only source of our sponsorship. And so uh, 2020, 2021, we started uh, the open source research experience. Uh, 2021, we actually started it being outside UC Santa Cruz for mentors. So mentors uh, who were from other UC campuses or labs um, were um, eligible for, uh, eligible to, to work under the OSRE in 2021, 2022. So 2021, it was just the, like one of the labs we were working with. Uh, by 2022, we had actually been able to expand it to four different campuses and, or three campuses in the, in the lab. 
Um, and so we saw a really nice big um, uptick and that was almost, that wasn't a hundred percent GSOC, but a lot of it was like, oh, with GSOC, the more mentors you get typically, the more, the higher number of students you get. Um, so that was a, that we saw what I thought was a big increase. The, it was even a larger increase in 2023 because summer reproducibility basically helped us double the number of students that we were able to support. Uh, and again, that, so that went from the four UC camp, we still had like a three or we had a similar number of UC campuses and labs uh, represented in those numbers, but then we had um, mentors from all over the world, from all over, well, well, mainly uh, within the US based, but a, a lot of different, a lot of different um, universities. Uh, and a number of you are on the call. And so I want to stop there for a second. Um, I was gonna go, I'll go over the details and the timelines um, in, in the next few slides, but I had the specific questions that were asked on the forms that I wanted to go ahead and just answer because I think they're really like ones that everybody kind of who are new to this kind of have. Um, I think the question, first question is what does uh, UCSC provide beyond this matching um, activity? Um, we basically, uh, we are, we or our sponsor provides the stipend for students. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how that stipend comes together um, in, the, in some later slides, but um, and we or the sponsor in the case of GSOC or ones like GSOC take care of the administration. So all of the summer reproducibility students are seen as uh, fellows under UCSC and under a UCSC based program. So we, the main administration is taken care of uh, in that case, 100% by here in Santa Cruz. Um, uh, in the case of students who are funded under GSOC, I, they actually, they have a separate administration under Google. And so they don't, I don't interact with their administration at all. Um, but uh, but there is a lot of overlap of what the activities actually look like. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and there, there's a question about commute resources. Uh, that's not typical. I mean, I'm not sure who asked that question, but um, that wasn't typical, but we can't, it can't be requested in a case by case basis. We have, uh, it kind of just depends. I guess that's the best. It's like not really, but it depends. So it might be something to, to, um, is it, oh, is it Ben? You were asked that question, I think. Yeah. Did you want to? Yeah. Thanks, Stephanie. That was my question. And yeah. I was thinking of Cloud Lab uh, when oh, I asked cool. about people resources, but I was just curious what, what resources were there. Um, uh, so with the stipend, do the students have to live in a particular place? Okay. That, I'll talk about that. I, I'll, I'll briefly touch on this now. And then I have a slide that talks about that a little more in detail, but um, th there are no limitations of where they live, but their stipends are based on if they are outside the U.S., their stipends are based on GSOC. The, I use the same um, GSOC stipend rates, and those are based on where they live. And it's uh, you know I can get I can get I think I I don't remember if I put the link there, but um, there they I can show you the twenty twenty three numbers. Um, it's like typically I think certain places it's you know a six thousand dollar stipend, some places it's a three thousand, and it really kind of depends on the um, standard the 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 you know the average. At average wage in in this the place that they live. It's a purchasing power parity kind of. Uh, okay, thanks. Um, and and gen generally, it's been seen as a, you know, uh, for for many of the students coming they're working outside the, uh, the U.S., they they don't see it as like a uh, they see it as a, a d decent amount for a, a summer internship. So, um, uh, can people mentor more than one student? Um. Yes, but we typically like to have mentor and co-mentors, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, definitely, we've had, especially some of our reproducibility folks, we had a number, uh, I'm looking at Freda, um, <laughs> who had multiple students um, working with them over the summer. GSOC's a little weirder about it. They they do want to see um, two names on any given student's project, just I think because the concern, especially over, this happened a lot during summer, reprodu uh, sorry, during uh, COVID, because there was a concern about um uh um because there is concern about like people getting sick and not and students not having somebody to to um to work with so um so they they particularly want one student one mentor but if you have co-mentors it tend it tends to be a little they're a little easier on that and I'll talk a little bit about co-mentors too but that you know that could be anybody is is just like 
a backup person, somebody actually integral. In, you can either have someone really integrally integrally involved in the project, or you can just basically have someone as a backup. And um, and we can talk about that in a bit. Um, does any limitations in the of the project needs more than the summer to clean up? We've had the the GSOC projects actually um, have a there there there's a lot of flexibility on letting uh on extending there's no more funding involved with it and that we typically use that that model as well but they do um but they do let it, i mean you can't actually say oh i was original end date was like september 1st but we actually need two more weeks so they just extend it two more weeks um uh but again that's i've also had uh mentors who have said hey we actually feel like we need some more work done to really get this to go and they've chosen to hire the student as an intern themselves, but that's not funding that we will particularly uh, specifically provide if it goes outside the original um, kind of project timeframe. Normally it's, you're still supposed to be fit into the um, the number of hours you originally set or generally in the number of hours. So um, so it, like I said, it kind of depends on a few things. It's a case by case basis on that. There's not, it's not a firm no, it's just really depends. Um, a uh, question about students, who the students can be. Actually, we have, like I said, it used to be very much bath, bath, uh, uh, undergraduate students, uh, but nowadays, uh, for GSOC type, that, that those those um, students working on open source projects, it kind of uh, goes across the board. Um, there's they undergrads are kind of the fun, like the largest portion, but I definitely have seen an increase in master's and PhD students. Also just folks that are new to the subject or to the area, uh, like to, to like be it open source or reproducibility are actually, so anyone new to it is really what, um, what people are that are a that are kind of eligible. They've removed the, the, you have to be at over 18 is the other, typically for GSOC. Um, we had, did have one high school student last year working on us, working with us, um, individually uh, on a project and that that was actually very successful as well so there's a there is some a lot of flexibility on that and like if people have questions about individuals just ding me and I can probably tell you each situation um, international, international students are definitely allowed they're actually the largest proportion of the students that we have are um, not in the U.S. and we also were able to figure out how to do U.S. based international students so students at non-U.S. citizens at UN, U.S. universities um uh and but they have to be OP, using OPT or CPT time, um, depending on what they're, you know, what what um degree they're at. Uh and I'm the those um those can be arranged either if I'm the for the summer reproducibility folks, I arrange mode, I arrange or I arrange. I sign the letters for that. Um and then for uh GSOC, actually I think I realize GSOC actually asks the org admins also to to sign the letter for that too. And so it's it's doable on for the, anyone working on any of the OSRE, um, uh, anywhere within OSRE that that can be done. It, but it does take some time and we do need to like, the, the OPT CPT thing has to happen in order for them to, if they stay in the US. They, I did have students who decided to go back home for the summer, they're US based, but they're back home for the summer. And then, then, then it would, didn't matter, then they could, work without having to worry about the OPT or CPT. Is it OPT? I think I'm calling it right. You know what I mean, <laughs> getting the work visa. Um, so here's uh, getting back to the discussions about um, who could be a mentor. Uh, again, the summer reproducibility really helped us expand the students that, uh, the, the, the sorry, the our ability to work with people from all, um, all across the US and uh, US universities and other organizations looking to support production of or use of reproducible artifacts. For our coding specific ones, we were, we're happy to really to work. We, uh, the ones like GSOC and others that are similar to that, uh, we're actually able to work on with any UC affiliated faculty or researchers or graduate students even uh, working on projects that are, uh, that are or ultimately will be part of an open source community or ecosystem. So um, that's, uh, I mean, that's, so, but, so either of those, um, if you fit either of those, you are uh, able to be part of, of, of the OSRE. Um, and uh, I'll show, and 
this is what you what happens <laughs> as a as a, a mentor. Um, you start with basically what mentors are really doing is giving us um, our, their project ideas. And again, like I was mentioning earlier, students look at those ideas and they create they create an, a, a project proposal for what they're going to do. And there's certain stipulations um, that we that we go into um, we, that we go into in more detail. There's a, we have a template that helps them form what their application or what their proposal looks like. Um, and uh, but the, the the first start is the mentors going, hey, I have some stuff I want students to work on over the summer. And they create this, what is basically a, a, a project idea, a, a summary of a project that they wanna do and with specific uh, details listed. Um, uh, and I, we, I, there's a lot of the explanation is on the, on this, uh, on, um, the, uh, the link there, which is the correct one. It is the 2024, uh, link and, um, what, and just, you know, like you'll see here on, and the one, this example here that you have a topic area, um, you kind of give an idea of what skill, like what level, skill level you want, um, and the difficulty or the specific skills you want. And also the difficulty level, the size is. Uh, I is dictated since I try to keep everything consistent uh, for from GSOC and since GSOC is a different platform and different organization, they have specific rules. So a lot of the stuff I we do here, we try and keep consistent there. And so you'll see things like the size will be the same if you are an SOR or a GSOC or non, you know, if you're summer reproducibility or any of the topic areas that we're looking at. I like to keep that just it's just for consistency's sake. So their stipulation is a large project, basically a full-time project is 350 hours and a medium project uh, is considered a uh, part-time project is 175. So that's you know something that we stipulate what your estimation is with regards to um, the size of your projects. Uh, we submit, um, each project has, will have a separate webpage and in a little bit, I think I'll have Carlos kind of show that off <laughs> on, on how that works. Uh, maybe at the end, if people have questions. Um, and uh, and um, and we, we basically you organize it based on you and your mentor team, uh, based on like, and so in this case, for instance, uh, uh, Farid had like package management and reproducibility was his top, let's say his top, the topic area that, you know, and his, his project area, his project name, like, um, and then, uh, and then each, and then under this page is all of your, would be all of your projects. And the students then go to this page and look at it and go, oh, hey, these are the things I'm interested in. Then they will reach out uh, to you based on, you know, your, you know, you'll, you'll give them your, the email, your email, they'll reach out to you and go, hey, I'm really interested in your project. And this is what I think I can do. And you interact over the course of maybe a month or two. Uh, while they create their program, their proposals for the program. Um, I can, I'll go over the, the timeline for that in a second, but I don't have the exact dates yet because again, I try to keep everything parallel with Google Summer Code just for ease and uh, of every, just so everyone has the same deadlines, uh, at least for the proposal period. Um, and so, and they haven't scheduled those yet, but typically it's around early to mid February. Um, let me see anything else from this page. Does anybody have questions about how this works? I can, I would say I can, uh, Carlos is willing to do a little bit of a demo at the end too, so. All right, um, let me see. Now, so student proposal, students get feedback from mentors through the process. And I'm happy if like, if people have questions about how that works. Um, uh, oh, wait. Um, if people have projects for, uh, sorry, sorry, I have questions about how that kind of worked like in real time for, or in, in actuality for a number of the mentors, I'm happy to let some mentors kind of chat about how that process works. Um, but students come to you, they, they create, they're creating the proposal, but you're giving them feedback, um, throughout the pre-proposal, the pre-deadline, the, the, the pre-submission stage. Um, so it's really a nice iterative, um, process for some for some folks uh it can be a little for some mentors it's 
it's tough because you have a lot of interest. I think Frida had a lot of interest and I know Oscar did last year. Um, and so you're dealing with a lot of students all of a sudden. So that's something where, you know, org admin here is hopefully going to be able to help at least work with your, give you some pointers on that. Um, but sometimes it is just making sure, you know, go flogging through a little bit of like a lot of emails um, to figure out, you know, to figure out who the real, the, the interesting students are that you want to work with. And I'll, I'll let them talk to, to, to their experiences as well. Um, and we, we give a selection criteria to our mentors, but it is up to the mentors to choose, to finally choose who they want to work with. It is not, we don't, we don't make that call. It's really mentors and it's based on your interactions with them over that. And that's why that proposal period is actually really important because you get to know them um, and you can kind of identify pre-proposal pre, uh, who, who of the group that you uh, that are putting the proposals in that you would want to work with. Um, and mentors then get to rate their students. And that's a whole process that I go into I will go into it later because it's very, it's a little com, com, it's a little convoluted these days because of the changes, some changes that were done within GSOC that we're trying to like stay in parallel with. Um, but basically it allows you to say, hey, this is my first choice. I want to work with three students or I or my team want to work with three students. Here are my, here are my ranked, my ranked students. Um, and again, uh, yeah, and we can go into, I can answer more questions about how that all works if you have overlapping, you know, students working on the same project and that type of thing, if people have questions on that. All right, so the overall process here, you as mentors post to projects, potential students review these projects, uh, they reach out to you, um, the students create the proposals with your input, you review these and you rate them. Um, we determine the number of slots based on resources, um, and administrators assign, and then we, we look at your ratings, like how you rated folks. I try and make sure everybody gets their first choice. Um, and that, that's typically worked out every, unless you know, there's reasons why that, that can, that can fall. That's why you want a second choice. You want to kind of backups for some choices. Um, but typically people get their first or second choice. And then the, the work begins in the summer, typically first end of May, beginning of June. There is also a month or so what they call the what's what we kind of call onboarding, what GSOC calls, calls the bonding period, which I think is a weird term. I think onboarding makes many more sense. So, but you basically a time for before you actually start your work where you get to know the student and the student gets to know your community. Right. So that's the overall process. Um, this is draft timeline again, I because I don't have the numbers yet from from the GSOC. Uh, this is kind of how it looks. Everything we January up until J February, you mentors are adding the proposal. Sorry, sorry, adding their pro their project ideas, and then we put in we use those project ideas to help uh, bolster our application to be a Google Summer of Code. Uh, mentor organization. Every year we have to reapply. We've had very good success. So we typically, and we're now the large enough to not feel uh, you know, too nervous about it, but it's never a guarantee. If we don't get GSOC, we have other ways of supporting students, but it's a really, it is a really nice, it's a, uh, nice single sponsor to work with. Let's put it that way. Um, and this is kind of how it works. So it basically runs from February to October. I'll have this on the website and update it there as I get the numbers. Um, and uh, I mean, as I get the specific dates um, slotted in, but this is kind of the general flow um, of how, when things happen. And the October, the most students end up late August, early September, um, but the, um, and then we typically like to try and help uh, give students an opportunity to talk about their work um, in October. All right, um, let's see, I only have a few more slides. I wanna just go, because there is a lot of confusion that happens and I wanna kind of talk about this at the beginning and, and I'll reiterate some of this. Um, I'll reiterate some of this like throughout the process just to make sure people are clear. Um, so all programs, the OSRE is basically the umbrella program and the 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 difference is who's, who's actually 
directly sponsoring the students. So the, uh, there's SOR sponsored students, there's GSOC sponsored students, and we also have a small number of students who are OSRE sponsored by other folks, be it someone within our Baskin, be it an industry interested in a particular topic. You know, there's a couple different, sorry, Baskin Engineering are, you know, through from our engineering group. So it might be a UCSE student specifically. Um, so those, but typically everybody gets treated by me the same in the sense of I treat them like I, they're, they have similar processes that they have to go through evaluations. They have to go through final, um, you know, final, you know, making blog posts, everything that all of the contributors are treated We you know, they can be, we call them fellows and they're all treated kind of similarly in that way. And their processes are very similar, except they may have to work through GSOC versus working through UCSC to, or, you know, another sponsor. Um, uh, and then who, ha who sponsors which student? A lot, it depends on a number of factors. Um, and that decision kind of gets made by us at that point. So GSOC has, I expect a certain number from GSOC and there's certain, I know there's certain limitations that GSOC has. So I'll say, oh, this student is probably more um, suited for summer reproducibility or funding specific. So that, so, but that's kind of done once we see where all the students fit. Um, and there isn't really a, oh, you're more likely to get, you know, this or that. It really depends. We just look at all the students who are all the top choices and how we we fit them into um, the slots available for the from the sponsors. Um, and these are the questions we have to, are they responsible reproducibility? Then yes or no, they, they may both fit under um, the summer reproducibility better than another part of OSRE. Um, the, the mentor affiliation, um, is there a mentor affiliation as uh, connected to uh, UC, uh, University of California? Then they might fit under better under like GSOC versus SOR. So it's a lot of this type of thing. Um, and again, there's this question, US based versus international. It, you know, and then maybe it's easier to have a GSOC as uh, international student working working from GSOC because that they have they have more consistent kind of their their processes are a little bit easier. Um, it's not that they can't work under summer like something funded that's sponsored by UCSC. It's just a little less of a headache and if it goes over there. But those are like some of the decisions that get made. Um, the one big one is um, is the student already working with the mentor or at the same university? We allow that under OSRE, but GSOC does not. Um, so if there's a student like that, I need to know that so I know not to put them under GSOC because there could be ramifications on that. Um, that doesn't mean they're not going to get a slot. That just means I need to know that they're going so their 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 slot is funded. All of the funding, by the way, is we keep it consistent. So all of the stipends and stuff are consistent. So they don't so from that perspective, they're also not seeing their students are not seeing a difference. Um and uh, the student application processes and reviews are identical. And I put the high ha asterisk there to remind me to say unless they're working with you already as a student or part of your affiliation and, and then we have a different, I will do it, I will actually remove them from the normal process because uh, because of the GSOC overlap. Um, and student evaluation processes uh, will, are, however, are on different platforms because GSOC students have to go through their GSOC, the GSOC sponsored students go through the GSOC platform. Um, and then we have a separate one for anyone else, all the other just OS, the SOR, other OSRE students. Um, and that becomes more clear once we get to that process. So, um, but this is one of the questions people um, consistently have, and this will be explained in detail once we're actually at that stage in, in the early spring. So again, it's quick program features, um, students paid to work. So everybody is paid. The, the All the students are, are given a stipend. Um, the, we use, I get it, as I mentioned, we stat, use GSOC uh, rates for particularly the undergraduates or non, or or like other new new newcomers, um, we are, and that really base varies based on student residency. And again, that's a purchasing power parity. If they're living in uh, a different, if they're like living in Indonesia, their um, their rate is different than somebody living in Japan. But it's based based on purchasing power parity of their particular where they're actually living. Um, we have we do allow for an increased uh, higher rate for. US-based PhD and master students. We did that last year and it worked out quite well. We try to use more competitive rates based on um, internships from like say the labs or something, we use those rates. 
uh, for um, for PhD and master's students. And those will probably adjust a bit this year. We'll, we'll look at the current rates. Um, start and end dates are flexible and dependent completely on what the mentor and the student agree to. But by flexible, it's typically like start in June and in August, you could have, typically don't start earlier, but you can end. I mean, I we've had, we had someone even end November. That's not ideal, but, but you know, moving it into September, late September or something like that is not, is not unheard of. Um, and projects have a varying like amount of time that uh, full-time versus part-time. Um, uh, mentors working with students. They, so and mentors are, again, are you work with the students you select. It's you're not given a student, you select the students based on uh, your interactions with them. A real key point is that you are not really meant to work more than five hours per week per student. I know that that's uh, some of the mentors probably are laughing on that one. That is the ideal um, that we are trying to not overload mentors. Um, and this is supposed to be a boost for your work. Um, but uh, I think that, uh, and I think last year when I did the, did the quick check from mentors of how many hours they spent, that was actually still a, a good average. Um, some some spent more, some spent like 10 hours, but it might had to do with the student. It might have to do with how in, involved the student and the mentor's work together was. And so they actually interacted with them more, but it was a positive thing. Generally speaking, everybody found the amount of work they did with their students for on it is a very positive. Um, and now, and then again, so because part of this is that it's really meant to impact, positively impact your work. So not just giving the students this great opportunity, but having you be able to uh, move forward on your work um, and um, build communities and find students that you like to work with. And um, and that's that's one of our, that's one of the key points of, and also one of the reasons why we have a pretty high success rate. Um, last year, we actually had 100%, which was, you know, really great. We And we had, and we've only had a, a over the period, I think we've had like 98%, like over the, since tw we started this, it's a pretty high in number of uh, I would say successful, meaning both sides felt that they got something positive out of the experience. Um, some enhancements for those of you who are on here, who were here last year, um, I do want to do some additional mentor onboarding and support. Um, I tried to do some of, the, some of that last year, but it, I don't think I got enough. I'm actually increasing, uh, I'm getting some more uh, admin support uh, uh, to help me um, to free up my time to do more of this. Uh, and um, I do like the idea of creating a single platform for all of us, uh, at least for the summer reproducibility folks, because uh, the GSOC folks have their own kind of platform that's under, under that's Google running. I'd like something similar for summer reproducibility because I do think that my just random emails and Slack, uh, Slack channel discussions were, wasn't really as effective. And I got a little bit of that feedback from last year. So I'm, I'm working on that. Um, and I do want to create more time for mentors to kind of interact and create their own a cohort. Um, I also want to increase uh, activities this year between all of the students, no matter what their topic area is. And so they also have more of a feeling of a cohort, even if they're working individually with one mentor, they have, feel like they're part of a larger group. And then allow more student to student support channels, because I felt like last year we got a little bit of that and I saw how effective it could be. Um, and that's something I want to promote this year. Um, this is something, I, the discussion about red flags, I, and this is based on concerns that people have about, well, what if your student's not doing well, or maybe something's going wrong. And these are, um, trying to hopefully promote, work on that a little bit more to, um, to bring, to bring that up with, uh, um, just so people can identify concerns or, or, and basically we can head off any, con any issues with students uh, prior to things going off the rails. Um, and, uh, and also we've been trying to get more focus on professional expectations so we don't have students like just suddenly disappear and not tell their mentor where they're going, uh, which we had not last year, but the year before, um, and then try to try to avoid those type of situations. Um, and again, we have, we are open to sponsorships uh, for additional funders and we're trying to rearrange arrange that. We have, because of the, in, the increase of numbers from the summer reproduced with last year, we didn't focus as much on outside additional outside sponsors, but this year I think we're going to try to do that more so that we have a lot more flexibility with um, the types of uh, projects we're able to support. 
And I think that's it. So, and I apologize if we ran a little longer. I would like to give people time for questions. Um, all right, oh, I should stop. Okay, great. All right, I'm not sharing, right? No. All right. All right, I want to give, you know, first open it for questions and then maybe give Carlos a few minutes also to kind of show how they give a quick little demo or even Oscar or whoever's done it before uh, to show how you actually put um, the um, um, project ideas up since that's always the first thing everybody has to do. So does anybody have any, but before that, does anybody have any like specific questions that didn't get answered from the presentation? Carlos, do you want to go ahead? And people can ask while Carlos is getting this set up too. Do you want to set up show show that because that seems to be the first question everybody has. Oh, how do I pro <laughs> how do I how do I put my projects up? So another one is um, that while Carlos is getting that set up, so projects you I mean they go through us. We see them generally. We review them, make sure they're eligible. But it there isn't a real. We want to make sure they're eligible, but there isn't a really like oh you have to be accepted. So don't though yeah, basically if you have an idea. You send it to us. We look and make sure there's no red flag. Like, oh, that doesn't fit something, um, or that's weird. Like, or you forgot to do something. You forgot to add something. Um, and but then it, you know, we um, we accept the pull request and it, it goes up on the website. But Carlos, you want to show how you do that? Sure. Um, so you can always find us at the OSPO website, which is ucsc-ospo.github.io. Um, all the the entire program uh, project pages are within that website. Um, so in order to get to that, uh, to open source research experience, you can go to programs, go here. You know, there's a nice convenient button for RE 2024. Um, and so then there's like basically a table of contents here. Um, and so, uh, and there's instructions, basically, you know, it's just an overview. There's uh, instructions for students then the student pages that will accumulate over the course of the program where students uh, put updates. And then there's like uh, instructions for mentors on how to um, add projects and also add, um, add yourself. Uh, you know, if you don't already have a profile uh, on the website, you can add a profile, um, which means basically it gives you sort of a, a, a page that will, you know, show what projects uh, you're mentoring, um, and then those also get referenced in the student pages. Um, so there's basically two ways of getting instructions, right? One is sort of the uh, frequently asked questions that Stephanie put up here. And the other one are the instructions. And so the instructions look actually scarier than they, than they actually are. <laughs> um, uh, there are basically two options. Uh, one is uh, just send us email about the project, um, you know, what you want to actually say, if you don't feel like doing it yourself. But we highly encourage that you try to do this yourself, especially when you feel comfortable working with Git and GitHub. Uh, and uh, because that actually means that we have more time uh, for other things, you know, and as we grow this um project, you know, this becomes actually a lot of work for us to fill in this, this information ourselves. So this would actually, this helps us to distribute the effort. Um, the, um, uh, so let me just go through option B really quickly. Uh, there is basically the, this is the, the actual, uh, uh, the repository for the website. Um, the way this is structured, there's basically a top directory called content. Um, that content directory has a bunch of subdirectories and the one that you're looking for is project. Um, so here are all the projects listed on, for 2022 and 2023. We don't have a project yet for 2024, but the first one uh, who is uh, going to submit a project for 2024 gets to create the directory for OSRA 24. <laughs> So um, just to show how that's structured within that directory, we have basically two levels. One is the institution where the primary mentor for the project is, right? So uh, if you, for instance, at UCSC, you would go into UCSC, you would then, or create a directory for UCSC if it doesn't exist yet uh, in the new OSRE24 directory. 
and then create just come up with a a a project um, uh, name, right? Uh, something that's likely to be unique. Although it doesn't have to be unique across all the projects, just within the organization, right? So that's why we have these organizations in here. Um, so uh, and then each uh, of those projects is basically a directory, and in that directory you have two files typically. One is an a Markdown uh, index uh, file, index.md, um, and then a picture that is some kind of descriptive um, picture I'm picking here on, on <laughs> Oscar, sorry, but it's actually the nicest picture. Um, and then uh, some picture that, you know, that represents the project. And then you have like basically a, uh, uh, a the Markdown file uh, and, and, you know, one way to look at that is in the raw form, the Markdown file as all Markdown files has some kind of front matter. Uh, here, it's important to have a title, your author, which basically is going to be the short name for your profile. And I get into that in a moment. Uh, you can actually add a note where you can sort of uh, get a quick evaluation of you. And the way this shows up is when you uh, go into the um, you go into the projects. Uh, so I go typically from this here um, and then go to last year's project and you see basically that uh, you know the primary mentors are here and then when you do author note it is sort of this little eye and then this title sh uh, pops up when you uh, hover your cursor over it so that's how that shows up um, and then uh, so in this way it's Osborne incubator fellow Sue Santa Cruz and then the tags are really important, right? So one tag that absolutely has to be in there, actually two kinds of tags. One is OSRE24, right? That would basically make it show up on the website uh, that, uh, that we have here. So there right now there's no project, but when you have a project with that tag, it would show up in this uh, on, on this place. And then, um, and then you have basically the two categories, which are UC and then also reproducibility. Um, and so if UC means that you are a, a mentor associated with the University of California and reproducibility means whether your project is part of the sum of reproducibility or not, right? So those two tags, and then you can add any kinds of you know, meaningful keywords that kind that, that um, that you, you like to have your uh, project categorized under. Um, so the way those keywords are meaningful is when you go back to, there's like basically these project topics, they're actually across all years. Um, but then, you know, if you put like distributed systems, your project will show up uh, here. Uh, this is not, I'm, I might refine this because currently, you know, I like to actually have it by year, but the, there's still uh, a new functionality that came in recently that might allow that. Uh, but when I actually created this, that I couldn't figure out how to do that. Anyway, so um, uh, so that's, yeah. And then just put in a date, um, right? It's just year dash month uh, dash day. Um, and then you could also put a last mod if you want to, but it's not absolutely important. The way you structure the markdown file itself is you basically give an overview first of your project. So we can actually go back to this other way of, of looking at this. Um, so this is um, this is essentially the, the 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 general description of the project, and then you have a, a list of project ideas. Um, and so uh, these are uh, all listed in in sort of the third. Uh, you know, headline uh, uh, level, um, so three crosses, and then you start with like a list of uh, of sort of a quick overview of the the properties of that project, right? So some keywords, some skills, difficulty, the size, and I think Stephanie said something about you know sizes of projects. Um, then the mention uh, mentors. Uh, and here you basically can either 
uh, put in an email link like mail to colon, uh, or you can put this when you have a profile. Um, this will then show up. Uh, so let me see whether I can do a preview. No, this is actually preview. Uh, let me just go back here. Uh, the projects last years. So if you go into this thing, um, you know, the, the, this is a bad example. Let's see. Let's see now. Yeah. So uh, I can't, I can't find. So sometimes people uh, elect not to create a profile, but we highly recommend that you do. Um, so, hmm. Let's go further down here. Yeah, so here's here's a, a example where this mention shortcut, um, you know, this will basically create the name. Uh, and then you you get if you click it, it goes to this website that's part of this um uh, part of this the OSPO website. And there um you know you see all this information about yourself. Um, so yeah, so basically the, these ideas are essentially there's mentors and then, um, we actually add the contributors later on because you don't know, obviously where, who is contributing, who is going to contribute to these uh, project ideas. Um, but that's sort of something that we do, uh, later. Um, so as you can see, you know, some of the projects found mentors during the summer, last summer, or some of them didn't, um, that's fine, right? Uh, it's just, uh, these are, these are just the ideas. Um, so uh, that's sort of, um, in a nutshell, how this is structured. Uh, there are basically instructions, uh, uh, as I said before, where you can, uh, so this is for mentors, uh, the instructions. So this basically says, you know, what I just explained. Um, here are the two tags, you know, ORS R24, and then you see or reproducibility or both. Um, here's how you basically mention. And then here is the other instruction on how to create an, a, a mentor uh, profile. And again, that's also pretty straightforward. So you go basically into authors and you know you 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 basically have uh you create a directory for your own profile uh typically i would use your email prefix or some something that 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 is likely unique this unfortunately needs to be unique across everyone right so you have to when you create a name you will basically immediately see uh whether you have a conflict um any name works um but it helps of course to have a name that we can identify who that actually is based on based on the email address um so for instance if we can uh like friday's uh you know directory is each each author has basically a directory and then very similar to the project there's basically two files one is an underscore index.md and that's also again a markdown. Um, you know, here the uh, the it's important to you know, and this is also reflected in the instructions. You know, have a title which is your name. You have a username that basically you just put in authors, and this is the name that you named your profile as, and then. Uh, you say you super user false, you state your uh, position at the institution, and then you have like uh, any kind of number of links of, uh, you know, your institution. Uh, this could be a department, a center, uh, a research group, right? Uh, and then the, your more general institution, a, a short bio. Um, this will actually appear under each no, if you have like a, a blog post or something that you that you're posting, uh, this will actually show up there, and then you can have all kinds of social uh, academic networking 
icons, right? So there's basically the most basic one is an icon envelope. There's an icon path. FAS means something fantastic, uh, awesome, or font awesome. Exactly, font awesome. And as this is, uh, I forgot what the S means, but there's also a B, FAB for brands. So they, there you can sort of have like LinkedIn uh, symbols, so forth. Uh, you just look at different authors and they have these icons. And so you can see how that's done. And then really important is that you um, associate with some user groups. Um, so there's two user groups. There's Summer of Reproducibility Mentors. And let me just look for somebody like here. Uh, that's Emily's. And here you... Um, you know, she has more icons and then she is uh, in the user group, University of California Mentors, right? And this shows up when you go back to, um, uh, let's see, let's go back to them and then see the mentors and contributors, right? There's the administration and here you see the University of California Mentors and here the summer of previous three mentors. And so each profile, um, uh, you know, will show up here depending on, you know, what categories you belong to. And you can certainly be on both, right? So um, so we have people who are actually in, in both categories. So that's fine, right? It's just a, a list of, of, of categories uh, that you can have here. Uh, and then you should just write something about yourself, right? And, and so this is nice because Again, you you're showing up and and you know we like lots of pictures, <laughs> um, and uh, and therefore you know it, it's nice. It's also for the students; they can see you. They, there's like um, uh, you know, and we do the same thing with the students, right? So when you look at last year's project, uh, as the students uh, add their student pages, they also create author profiles. And these were the 23 contributors, right? Um, and that's really nice to see sort of all these people. It kind of puts a face on this whole project. Um, so just really quickly, there is, um, so when you actually, again, uh, the workflow is such that, um, let me just, yeah, so the workflow is such that you basically start forking this project, right? I can basically uh, create this fork here. Um, you copy the main branch only. Um, and then when you have this fork, uh, this means basically uh, that you then uh, have essentially created a branch. Um, and now you can, what I would suggest that you can uh, then you create a new branch for your changes. And then when you actually, uh, so not just do your change on the main branch, but basically create a new branch. Um, let me see whether I can, I, I don't, I don't usually use this, um, yeah, new branch. And then I just basically say, you know, Carlos, um, uh, test. Right, and uh, yeah. and so this is a branch that's now part of my organization, right? And so, um, so if you if you go to that um, calls M test branch, you can then basically do all those edits, and then. When you commit your edits, you basically get a link to create a pull request against this. And, and one of the choices of doing this pull request is against this organization. And that will actually show up in uh in the in the in this organization's in in, in the OSPOS organization uh, pull requests, right? So um if you're going back here, you will we will see these pull requests showing up. And then we'll review them, uh, suggest any changes if necessary, and then otherwise merge them, and then they become automatically part of the website. Um, so if you want to go a little fancier, there's actually a, uh, and I'm I'm sending the links here. 
Let's see where where's the zoom. Yeah, the uh, the the links to there's basically uh, GitHub is is providing an IDE, and so what you could do is um, uh, if you have forked the project, the uh, the cool thing is that basically you just replace the .com in the URL uh, of your of your repositories with the .dev. And that gives you basically an editor, right? And so the nice thing for that is uh, you can just navigate much quick, more quickly uh, around the, the repository. And then um, when you do, for instance, a project, right, you can then basically just um, say, I want to copy this one, right? So you have all this functionality and you just copy this project and 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 put it under the you know new. Os re twenty four, and then edit that, and and then commit. Uh, you can actually choose the branch. I think here we go. Yeah, here we go. So change the branch to this, right? So this is this is a much nicer interface if you don't um, want to just do it on the web. Um, and then you can just do all the things basically from your browser. You don't have to install. Um, Things and then the the way this is when you actually create a pull request, uh, I can show this um, like here. Uh, this is some pull requests um, uh, that actually creates a preview uh, of the, the website deployment, and so you can actually see how this will look like. Look like right. Um, so here we have actually a new website called Resources. It's clearly not finished yet, but um, that's sort of part of that uh, pull request. And so, you know, that's, but it's a really nice thing to have. Um, and so, uh, you know, so so when you create that pull request, you can actually check your work and, and then basically add more. One thing that I would also recommend is if you, what I typically, I monitor, these pull requests pretty closely. And so I tend to, when I see a pull request, I tend to just look at it and review it. Um, and if you want to signal that you're not quite done yet, or you you basically have, you're like half done, and but you want to like maybe have to work on something else for a longer period of time and don't want me to look at it, just convert it into a draft, right? That signals basically you're not ready to have that pull request reviewed. And then you can always, um, Convert it back into actual pull request later on. So any questions? I we have a few minutes left from the original amount of time. Sorry, I, folks, notice I put an extra fifteen minutes on just in case. Um, did uh, any of the existing um, or sorry, the previous uh, mentors want to add anything to what I discussed or their? Maybe something to be interesting for new, the new mentors. Uh, anybody? Oscar, you uh, seem to want. Hey. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yep. Well, um, I guess first first thing is like, does anyone uh, on the call have any questions on you know the previous mentors, like something specific? That was going to film. Well, um, I mean, Tiffany and Carlos already covered pretty much everything there is to cover, or it seems to me. But I'll just say, um, yeah, when like the the application process, especially when the students start sending proposals, can be pretty pretty messy because there is a lot of email communication or email traffic, and yeah, it's you you really have to be you really have to be like um aggressively pruning the tree of of just like who are you going to communicate with otherwise you'll just spend like weeks talking to different people so um yeah it's kind of a quality problem to have because stephanie and and you know whoever else is advertising these programs they're actually reaching out to a lot of people and so definitely as a, as a first-time mentor which was last year i was very 
like not calibrated to how much how much interest there would be and so i was just talking to way too many people and wasting time doing that and then also i i just took on too many students uh, i took four students last summer and that was just way way too much um way too many and this summer i took on two students and that was just much much better um so yeah my my expectations initially were that you know coming from the academic environment the students are very driven and like self-reliant and they can do all the things on their own and just really like as a mentor need you for uh whatever they don't know but you know these are typically people on the level of undergrad um and they really they really need a lot of time a lot of attention to to actually like accomplish the project um and so just you know kind of the the rule i came <laughs> came up with this year was just um treat it as a zero sum game like the student will do a lot of a lot of uh, useful work uh, but you also have to put on, put in a lot of time uh to 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 make that happen and so um yeah that's kind of the uh the the, the mindset that i have now and it's worth it because on the way you get stuff done and also they they get to learn a lot of things that they have no idea about um i had some freshmen who did actually amazing amazing job um because they are they are really driven by the fact that they are just learning all these new things so yeah in the end it works out for everyone just just be reasonable with your time um or like expectations uh these are not usually phd students um Another point that um, that kind of stuck with me is just that um, the students are, they can be quite unreliable when it comes to communication. Um, like some of, some people are very diligent and will follow up, you know, instantly, but some are, are not. And they'll, they'll drop out. They'll say, you know, oh, I have, like the full intention to work with you on this project and I'm excited and then they'll never reply. So I don't know, you know, why that is, but you know, it is what it is. And um, you just have to kind of assume that, um, yeah, basically set, set the rules, I would say, like set the rules for communication, not, not expect initially that the way you communicate is going to be followed up by these people because they just come from a different environment or, or they just have, tons of different applications to to take care of and they don't have time i don't i don't really know the reasons um but yeah just just be be prepared to um to invest some time and and just just do these things robustly like not not assume too much um and just just be sure that you you state very clearly what you expect and and have them state what they expect so that you know that the, the 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 both parties can meet each other. Um, okay. Um, we're we're kind of on. Yeah, we're at the limit of time. Mm. Um, I just want to say, uh, quickly uh, to follow up a little bit about what Oscar was saying. Uh, we do are we are setting up this year again some sort of uh Slack channels and the like. We do find I do find it you know I, I, I you know like different mentors have different ways of uh that they set up communication i think oscar i think you did slack and and email um other folks did use discord um so a lot of times they go what with what makes most sense for them and then what works with the what like what uh what um oscar was saying what works with between the mentor and the and the student um and and generally yeah we i mean there's definitely a lot of i think his he yeah oscar you had a lot of interest <laughs> we do have uh, i would say that uh i think there, it's a wide spectrum like some folks get five or six uh in of interest uh we have we had one group uh that get the, like 20 i think friday got a huge amount last year and it is yeah there is a, and we'll have more discussions about um as we move forward on like as as people we get to that stage we start talking a little bit more about how best how giving mentors some best practices on how to deal with that um, and also um, interactive interaction between other mentor, the different mentors. That's kind of one of the things like I was saying, I was trying to highlight more this year is having more uh, cohort support 
and support from from our end as well. Um, but any other questions or comments before we wrap up? All right. All right. Well, um, I'm going to post this video online. Um, feel free to, for those of you who are here to share it with any of your um, colleagues you think might be interested. And we'll also have a, another follow-up. Um, I'll have another one of these sessions uh, at the beginning of the year. And again, hopefully we'll have more details um, on the actual dates by then. And I'll try and everyone who's registered here, I'll make sure gets the links to, um, to the videos and also gets updates, uh, updated emails on, on, on the information. So, all right.